Hello, my name is Rachel O'Sell, and in this presentation, I am going to be explaining to you carbon, life's essential element. Now, before we jump into things, I would just like to lay out before you things and some expectations I have for you in this presentation. After it, you should be able to identify the element carbon on the periodic table. Now, this should go far beyond just simply telling me where it physically can be located, but some of the properties that come along with a specific location of an element on said table. Not only that, but after this presentation, you should also be able to list some examples of carbon's abundance on Earth. Um, with this, I'm meaning comparing it to some other elements and how abundant they are, but also where carbon can be found and extracted from Earth. You should also be able to compare and contrast two of carbon's most widely used and well-known allotropes. And most importantly, in my opinion, you should be able to explain why an understanding of carbon is important for students studying at the AP level, that is AP chemistry. So let's jump into it. Why do we need to learn this? The age old question, when am I ever gonna use this? Well, as an AP student, advanced place chemistry, the assumption is that you are moving on to a post-secondary level where you are going to be studying various science-related topics. Now, if this is the case, it is essential to lay a foundation of foundational understanding of these different elements. For example, carbon in this case. It is the backbone of organic chemistry. So an understanding of carbon now will set a really strong um, cornerstone for you in following years of study. Now, carbon's unique bonding properties allow for an unparalleled diversity of compounds. So even if you are one who is not planning to study science at the secondary level, the post-secondary level, um, it is important to understand life around you. So being that carbon is the essential element for life, it is able to tell us how things like DNA, proteins, fuels, and different pharmaceutical drugs are produced. So overall, it is very important. And in understanding the unique bonding properties of carbon, one is hopefully able to understand um, some properties of other elements and how they might bond differently. So let's get into carbon specifically. Where can it be found? Carbon is the fourth most abundant element in nature, just behind hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. So where on earth can it be found? One of the top places is in earth's atmosphere. In Earth's atmosphere, carbon is found in the carbon-containing compound of CO2, otherwise known as carbon dioxide, and this is a gaseous form. In order to harness this um, material, it is typically used in industrial techniques. Now, not only in Earth's atmosphere, but carbon and its carbon-containing molecules can also be found very prevalently in Earth's crust. Here are some examples of specific compounds, minerals that are very, very um, saturated with carbon, those being limestone, dolomite, and coal. Various uses, coal probably being one of the most familiar to you, being a fuel source, but others as well, limestone for building, and so on and so forth. So with this background in mind, I mentioned how we were going to be comparing and contrasting some various allotropes of carbon. On this screen, you will notice my lists here of two very commonly used carbon allotropes. The reason I am comparing the properties of these and not just listing carbon on its own is because carbon's wide diversity of bonding abilities leads to very diverse properties. So this will give us a nice snapshot of some of the relative properties that carbon possesses. So, in diamond, for example, you'll notice that it melts at a temperature of roughly 3,800 3, degrees Celsius, which is roughly 300 degrees Celsius greater than that of graphite. Diamond also has a relatively high density compared to that of graphite, noting these pretty extreme differences for going from one element's allotrope to another. Diamonds are also exceptionally hard. Um, diamond possesses a lattice of many carbon-carbon bonds that are covalently bonded together. These covalent bonds are extremely strong. Now, graphite, on the other hand, is relatively soft. It still possesses these strong carbon-covalent bonds. However, it also exists in sheets that have some pretty weak van der Waals forces 
is, um, exhibited within them. So that brings the strength down a little bit. Um, diamond has a high refractive index, which describes the way light is able to either pass through or reflect off of an object. And it is a great electric insulator. Graphite, on the other hand, is resistant to most chemicals, therefore it's pretty chemically inert, and it is an extremely efficient thermal conductor, meaning it has a great capacity to transfer that heat energy from one place to another. Now, this amazing tool we have, the periodic table, is going to be able to tell us a lot of information about this element carbon just from a glance. So if you're unable to uh, um, spot it out just by looking, I've circled for you towards the top right, Carbon is a group 14 element. So a group on the periodic table is the vertical column. You'll notice the little number 14 above carbon there. Um, and just this placement of the element tells us a little bit about it. So compared to all other group 14 elements, carbon has a relatively small atomic radius. Um, if you know anything about periodic trends, you know that the radius of an atom decreases as you move down in a group. So being that it is at the top, it's relatively small. This is due to the fact that its effective nuclear charge is greater, so those electrons really hang in there tightly. Also, another periodic trend is that electronegativity increases as we move up and to the right of the table. Now, being that it is in the top right quadrant of the periodic table, carbon does have a relatively high electronegativity. This is a way of explaining how strong and the ability an element has to attract neighboring electrons and therefore form bonds. So carbon is relatively good at this. Now, if we take a snapshot of carbon, we're able to zoom in and see this here. Notice the element symbol for carbon is a capital letter C. Um, above that letter C, you will notice a number six, which is the atomic number. This indicates that all carbon atoms have exactly six positively charged protons, and in a neutral atom has six electrons as well. That 12.01 on the bottom is indicative of carbon's atomic and molar mass. Um, but more importantly, I want to focus on this Bohr model we have to the right. If you notice, we have two black rings surrounding that carbon nucleus doesn't show the breakdown of protons and neutrons, but I really want to focus on those electrons. Now, the outermost ring, labeled number two, that is known as the valence shell of this Bohr model. So if you're able to count all those dots, you will count a total of four circles representing electrons, valence electrons, meaning they can form bonds. So if we have carbon, this is its Lewis dot diagram. Notice how those four electrons that we have are not paired up. They are existing as lone electrons, meaning they are really reactive and really want to form bonds. An element ideally has eight valence electrons in that outer shell. So we are able to get four more, which is a lot. Um, this unique property of carbon allows it to form multiple bonds with itself, such as alkenes and kinds, carbon, carbon, double, and triple bonds, but also multiple bonds with other different elements. can form double bonds with oxygen, for example, just like in CO2, as previously mentioned. Now, not only is carbon widely able to form bonds and essential for use in biological realms for DNA and proteins and the like, there are many other advancements in research going on for carbon's uses in technology. Um, this is a little snapshot of the abstract of a peer-reviewed article that describes the influence that carbon has on polylactic acid filaments for electrotechnical products. So if you go through here, it is very clear to see that carbon is not only great and essential for life, Right? If you look at a molecule of DNA, you'll notice those hydrocarbon backbones making up the whole thing. It hits the whole other side of the coin for engineering and physics and the like, different sciences, different applications. So if you are someone who is not necessarily interested in organic chemistry, it's not for everybody, I understand that. It is still super important and essential to understand carbon and the way that it is able to form bonds if you are someone who plans to live in this society and be a functioning member of it. As we continue on, it is important when looking for, through research to find articles that come from credible sources. 
peer-reviewed articles being the top choice here. So that previous article I shared from you isn't, of course, peer-reviewed and cited within my presentation here. So please make note, if you are planning to continue through this research, I highly recommend using your school's library to locate such resources needed for yourself. I hope you were able to get some strong takeaways about the element of carbon and gain an understanding of why it is so important for you in your life. Thank you.